I'm talking about this guy named Solomon. He was the third king in the united monarchy in ancient Israel. So we're back in a period here, almost 1000 BC. And so we're up to chapter 5 this week, kind of trying to breeze through this story. We read in verse 1 that King Hiram of Tyre had always been a loyal friend of David, that's Solomon's father. When Hiram learned that David's son Solomon was the new king of Israel, he sent ambassadors to congratulate him. And then Solomon sent this message back to Hiram. You know that my father David was not able to build a temple to honor the name of the Lord his God because of the many wars waged against him by surrounding nations. He could not build until the Lord gave him victory over all his enemies. But now the Lord, my God, has given me peace on every side. I have no enemies, and all is well. So I'm planning to build a temple to honor the name of the Lord, my God, just as he had instructed my father David. For the Lord told him, your son, whom I will place on your throne, will build the temple to honor my name. And so this... Now's the occasion to build a temple to honor the name of the Lord. And so he says to Hiram, please command that cedars from Lebanon be cut for me. Let my men work alongside yours and I'll pay your men whatever wages you ask. As you know, there's no one among us who can cut timber like you Sidonians. When Hiram received Solomon's message, he was very pleased and he said, praise the Lord today for giving David a wise son to be king of the great nation of Israel. And then he sent this reply to Solomon, I've received your message and I will supply all the cedar and cypress timber you need. My servants will bring the logs from the Lebanon mountains to the Mediterranean Sea and make them into rafts, then float them along the coast to whatever place you choose. And then we can break the rafts apart so you can carry the logs away. You can pay me by supplying me with food for my household. And so it was in the mid-spring, in the month of Ziv, during the fourth year of Solomon's reign, that he began to construct the temple of the Lord. This was 480 years after the people of Israel were rescued from their slavery in the land of Egypt. And so we've reached a, the beginning of the construction of the Temple of Israel, which turns out to be kind of a significant thing in, uh, as we go down through the rest of the Old Testament, uh, and even up in Jesus' time, you know, this was, a, by then it was the second temple, but this was a, uh, a place that signified all these, uh, this elaborate uh, truth about God, His nature, they had this sacrificial system that kind of displayed and demonstrated principles of God's justice and how people had to approach God through an intermediary in priests and how they had to offer, a, uh, offer animal sacrifices as a principle of substitution, the innocent dying in place of the guilty. And that all of this turns out to be a picture of the work of Jesus Christ. This verse in 1 Kings 6, 1 is important for historians because this is a, this entire period starting with the United Monarchy moving right through the divided monarchy in the Old Testament can be accurately, every event in this sequence can be accurately dated to the year because of the fact that we have a sequence of events given to us in Kings and Chronicles and the Samuels, Kings and Chronicles that form a continuous line and sequence of events. Those events correlate at multiple places with events in other ancient Near Eastern calendars, Egyptian, Babylonian, these guys up in Tyre and Sidon, And uh, historians line these up and start to realize they're all referring to the same events. And then there's a, the sequence is the same. And they can date the uh, key events through solar tables and eclipses. Mentions of of solar and lunar eclipses. Which, of course, we can date to to the very day. 
and they're mentioned in these different calendars, and then you line those up, and there you have, and then the whole thing lines up at, at that point. And so for this particular period of history in this part of the world, that work has been done using five different uh, national calendars that all lined up, and uh, with great confidence we can date these events to the year. And there, here then it says it had been 480 years earlier that the release from Egypt had happened. And so this, the entire chronology from Exodus 1 down through the, to the, through the time of Christ falls out perfectly from this verse. We read that this temple he built was really not that big. Uh, 90 feet long, 30 feet wide, 45 feet high. Well, it's about the size of this building. And in fact, really not as wide. It's only 30 feet wide. This is a good 45, 50 feet wide. So, I mean, it's quite narrow. It's really about, um, it's really not very big at all. It's tall, though. Imagine, it's only 30 feet wide, but it's 45 feet tall. Real strange. Uh, so it's very tall, soaring affair. Remember, we think, uh, people think of cathedrals and churches and stuff as places where people go in as a place of worship. This was not the case with the temple. It wasn't for the people to meet inside of the temple. They, they came outside of the temple. Inside of the temple, there was no furniture. There was an altar and then the, the 90 foot business was actually divided one third and two thirds, a 60 foot piece and a 30 foot piece. So the end was 30, 30, 30 on all four sides. That's the Holy of Holies. And then there was this outer court. And mainly it was just the priests doing their work in there. The uh, people could come in to observe, but then they'd go right back out. It wasn't like today where you actually go in and sit inside of like a church building or something like that. This place was just a, a display, a place of, to display these symbols and to teach on that, on that uh, level. There's an entry room. Some of your translations call this an entry uh, a porch. It's, it's apparently kind of a, a deck or porch out in front of it, another 30 feet. 15 feet extended out. Maybe it was sort of a covered porch. We read that he also made narrow recessed windows throughout the temple. He built a complex of rooms against the outer wall. So here's this only 30 foot wide room all the way around another set of rooms outside of it that went three stories tall. So that got to be pretty good size at that point. But those were mostly for storage. This is, they were, this is where they stored stuff, and maybe there were some meeting rooms. We don't even really know what these rooms were used for. We know that these timbers, you know, they go, they go into all that whole thing about how they were going clear up into Sidon to get the, the Cyprus and so on, and float it down to the coast, and then with oxen drag it up to Jerusalem, which is a 2,500-foot uh, incline in uh, elevation to get up there. And they got a hell out of timber. The whole, the whole temple was paneled inside. The floor, all the walls, and the ceiling was all wood. And then over the paneling, a lot of it was covered in gold, plate, uh, gold leaf. So a lot of wood, but also a lot of stone. The structure... It was, it was actually mostly stone, courses of stone, with, it says, occasionally there would be a wood course in between stone every third course or so. These stones uh, used in the construction of the temple were finished at the quarry so that there was no sound of any hammer, axe, or any other iron tool at the building site. It's an interesting, it's kind of reminiscent of earlier laws where we find often, for instance, that the altars they would build out of stone, that they were not allowed to shape the stones using any tool. They could not have any tool work on the altar made of stones. The reason apparently being that to communicate that if they were to tool it, to, to work the stone, to shape it with tools, that would suggest works. And so they weren't permitted to do that. And it's, this, this is likely to be the reason for this as well that they made a conscious effort to keep all sounds of uh, 
human works away from the temple.